Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to A Push. Today, we're going to talk about Jimmy Carter's administration and the crisis of competence and the degree to which Jimmy Carter was able to address the crises that we talked about last time in the mid 1970s. So here's your objectives for today. Take a moment, take them in and we'll dive in. As we hopefully remember from last time, the oil crisis caused by the U.S. support for Israel in the Yom Kippur War led to massive amounts of inflation, creating huge problems in the United States. In 1974, inflation peaked somewhere around 14 percent, eroding American spending power and really leaving the Ford administration without many options. The Ford administration recognized the existential crisis for them and tried to roll out a, a program called WIN or WIP inflation. Inflation now. Unfortunately, no one in the Ford administration really had any answers for this because any problem, any solution to the problem of high gas prices is a much more long term solution. We didn't have the domestic oil reserves or the domestic oil capacity to make up for the loss of OPEC oil. And so, as a result of this, uh, there's really very little that Ford can do to bring prices down during this time period. It's more of just a waiting game, and there's really not much that can be done here. And so in the election of 1976, uh, Ford is struggling with his credibility, with his, uh, with his policies, with his mandate, all of these things. He survives an assassination attempt by kind of dodging out of the way in San Francisco. And the image of Ford falling down on Air Force One is one that stay on, on the steps of Air Force One is one of the th images that stay with Americans and one of the sort of defining moments of the Ford presidency. There's a sort of insurgent challenge to take the Republican nominee away from nomination away from Gerald Ford and give it to Ronald Reagan. But it's really hard for parties to change presidents or to uh, kick a sitting president off the ticket. And so in the end, Ford gets the nod, despite the fact that most people would agree that he's not a super inspiring candidate. The Democrats go with Jimmy Carter who's a political outsider, relatively unknown outside of his state of Georgia, and he's an interesting character. He's very much an anti-Ford and anti-Nixon in that he's perhaps too honest, most famously giving this interview to Playboy magazine. So take a moment, pause and read. Uh, obviously, everything in this interview is true and nothing is particularly problematic. But as far as like, there is such a thing as being too honest and volunteering information that people probably didn't need to know about you. And that really sums up Jimmy Carter. In the end, he's going to win on a combination. I mean, honestly, just Americans frustration with the current economic system and the desire for change. His victory across the Deep South demonstrates that civil rights is not the driving issue in 1976. It's clearly issues about the economy. And the hope is that Jimmy Carter can provide a new direction for the United States going forward. And so he becomes president. Uh, what do you need to know about Jimmy Carter? Uh, he's a devout Christian. He's former governor of Georgia. He was a peanut farmer by profession. And Jimmy Carter had a relatively embarrassing family with his brother Billy famously parlaying his brother's political success to market his own brand of beer. So that's something that happened. As far as his actual policy goes, as far as actual policy goes, Jimmy Carter does try to deal with the energy crisis and he deals with it in his typical straightforward way. So take a moment, pause and read. Jimmy Carter's solutions are practical. They're more long term. They're probably beneficial, but for most Americans, they're not super inspiring. Being told that we just need to use less gas is not the message that Americans want to hear. Uh, Carter's Energy Act removes, puts taxes on expensive car, on, uh, in, uh, fuel inefficient cars and removes price controls from oil and gas produced in the United States, which has the long term effect of incentivizing new domestic fuel production, but the short term effect of rising fuel costs. And so short term pain for long term gain is not what most Americans want to hear. And Jimmy Carter telling you that you can't heat your house to the temperature you want and you should try to conserve fuel and then, you know, famously keeping the temperature at the White House relatively low and wearing a sweater repeatedly in order to sort of demonstrate what other Americans should be doing. On the one hand, I mean, yes, this is a practical solution. But on the other hand, it's not inspiring. It's not an immediate fix. And it's not what most Americans want during this time period. 
And so all this leads to what's called the malaise, a general period of sort of uncomfortability that's, that seizes control of Americans in the late 1970s, where we start to come to the conclusion that Americans' leaders might not have answers. There might not be quick solutions to these problems. And maybe this is the inevitable decline of the United States and our best years are behind us. Jimmy Carter tries to address this in his Crisis of Confidence speech, which, take a moment and pause and read. Like most Jimmy Carter speeches, this speech is not necessarily a bad one. There's nothing negative in this speech, and his answers to this are somewhat practical, but again, these are not easy fixes. Jimmy Carter is clearly stating that, you know, we don't have answers to a lot of these things, and it doesn't do much to restore Americans' confidence in American society. And so they mostly tune out Jimmy Carter and don't respond to this. The ERA finally dies during the Carter administration. It fails to get ratified by enough states and so does not become part of the Constitution. And so there is no Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution providing equal treatment for women. Uh, there's been a modern movement to revive the ERA, but there's a real question as, from constitutional scholars as to whether or not an amendment that passed Congress in the 1970s could still be ratified without having to go through the entire process of creating an amendment again. And most constitutional scholars would probably argue that it could not pass without going through both houses of Congress and being signed by the president again. So equal rights amendment does not become a thing. We enter into a period of stagna stagflation which is a combination of economic stagnation and inflation, a period of both high unemployment and also high inflation. Most economists had argued, or traditionally, this should be impossible. The Phillips curve shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation. And generally, in periods of economic growth, you've got high inflation and low unemployment. And in periods of economic stagnation, you've got high, high unemployment and low inflation. This low inflation then leads to increased spending, which spurs the economy. And when inflation is high, it leads to a slowdown in spending, which slows the economy. This is the basic path that establishes why we have the market cycle and why there's always a cycle of booms and busts within uh, any sort of free market economy. But a combination of the oil shock increasing prices and deindustrialization leading to high inflation led to a period where prices are rising and it was difficult for Americans to get a job. This, economic, this was an economic crisis for Americans and demanded some sort of response. But the problem for most economic policymakers is any solution to one of these two problems is going to hurt the other. You can grow the economy in order to cut down unemployment, but that's going to lead to even higher inflation. Or you can slow the economy down to try to bring prices down, but that's going to lead to higher unemployment. So this paralyzed American policymakers because going either direction makes the other problem worse. And so you're going to take a spectacular political hit either way. And so most policymakers didn't know what to do. And we were more or less paralyzed by this economic issue. Jimmy Carter is going to promote an idealistic American foreign policy abroad. He's going to support human rights. He's going to give the Panama Canal back to Panama or sign a treaty to eventually give it back to Panama, which on the one hand, probably good, but for critics of the Carter administration, decreases American power around the world. And so we're going to have a more altruistic foreign policy, less Machiavellian. Although, again, this is going to weaken American prestige abroad to some extent. He is going to finally solve the problem of the Yom Kippur War with the Camp David Accords, bringing in the presidents of Egypt and Israel. He finally is able to sign a treaty ending hostilities. And Egypt becomes the first Arab state to recognize and to enter into, a enter into negotiations with Israel. This is, a, this is a spectacular victory for Jimmy Carter because we're somewhat prying Egypt out of the Soviet sphere. sphere. Here we see Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, kicking out kicking out uh, Soviet premier uh, Leonid Brezhnev. But unfortunately, upon returning to Egypt, Anwar Sadat is assassinated by hardline, hardline Arab nationalists who support the Palestinians. And the basic message to most other Middle Eastern countries is don't support Israel or else your people might rise up and assassinate you. And then there's the Iranian revolution. <clears throat> Our handpicked dictator, as you hopefully remember, the United States uh, restored to power the Shah Reza Pahlavi to Iran, and he kept power through a combination of economic reforms and spectacular, spectacular oppression. 
the Iranian people, specifically led by students, launch a revolution to overthrow him? The students, in conjunction with religious leaders, use anti-American sentiment to rally the Iranian people, forcing the Shah to flee. The Shah then flees to the United States, where he is given asylum and is getting treatment for his cancer. One of the key moments of the Iranian Revolution is the storming of the U.S. Embassy and the seizing of, a, of Americans in the embassy, holding them hostage. This Iranian hostage crisis is spectacularly humiliating for the United States because the, the protesters and the hostage takers are demanding the return of the Shah for trial and likely execution. The Carter administration does not want to return the Shah because we feel like this would send a negative message to uh, our, other, our other leaders around the world that if your people overthrow you, we will no longer back you despite having you know, helped orchestrate your rise to power. So we refuse to return the Shah, so they return, refuse to re return or to release the hostages. The Carter administration attempts a rescue of the hostages, but unfortunately, as you can read here, the helicopters crash together because of a sandstorm and a number of Americans are killed. This was probably not Jimmy Carter's fault, but again, it contributes to the sort of fecklessness and helplessness of Americans during Carter's administration. And the nightly images of the hostages on television further undermine Carter's credibility and power. The Iranian oil shock also devastates the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy had already been facing an oil shortage because of the Saudi embargo. And so the lack of Iranian oil because of the revolution creates a massive shock, leading to a global oil shortage. And we're back to oil prices tripling yet again over their already high levels. Gas lines going around the block, gas stations running out of fuel and not being able to supply Americans, and a real sense of crisis because of our dependence on foreign oil. Over the long term, of course, we are going to develop domestic oil resources to prevent things like this from happening again. But during the 1970s, there's not really a sense of what we can do to solve this problem, at least not in the short term. And so this is going to further damage the already weakened U.S. economy. And then as the U.S. is kind of at the nadir of its fortunes here, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. We, of course, know that the invasion of Afghanistan is a long-term debacle for the Soviet Union and honestly for any country that decides to invade Afghanistan. But in the 1970s, this further highlights the problems of American foreign policy, the weakness of the United States, and it's going to lead us to funnel tons of money to, to Afghan insurgent groups, many of which will eventually become the Taliban. And so we're going to flood Afghanistan with weapons to help them resist the Soviets, which they do. But many of these weapons are going to fuel the rise of the Taliban, which, as you hopefully know, is not a long-term friend of the United States. And so foreign policy in the 1970s is super problematic. And so we'll leave us there, going into the election season of 1980. The general malaise and the crisis of confidence has gripped the United States, and we really feel like this may be the end of American dominance. This may be the end of the American century. We don't have a sense of direction or any real quick answers to the really deep and fundamental problems plaguing American society. And so what we're looking for at this time is a new direction, a new voice, and someone to, re to restore our confidence in ourselves. We'll leave you there for now. This is the end of Unit 8, so thank you for listening.